Yoruba Kingdom TV presents a history of the Yoruba people by Stephen Akintoye. Adabanji. Chapter TW0 Continuation. 49. History. But over a long time they almost all became consigned to the province of Ifa. Some Yoruba traditions indicate a new pay contribution to the earliest rudiments of the Ifa system in Yoruba land but the extent of such contribution is uncertain. According to traditions recorded in the late 19th century by Samuel Johnson, there lived in Ife in Priyadidwa times a man of Nupe extraction named Setilu or Agbonaregan, the latter being probably the name given him by his Ife hosts. Agbonaregan, practicing Ife divination, lived in some places in eastern Yoruba land, including Adu in Akiti, and Oo before he came to settle in Ife, where he acquired considerable influence on account of his Ife divination, and where he initiated many people into Ife mysteries and divination. Some apparently older traditions, however, have it that the practice of Ife divination was introduced to the world by the benevolent act of the God of Wisdom, Ife, himself, through the instrumentality of his sixteen children, and that, in its early rudimentary form, it was common among the Yoruba, Nupe, Edo and Ibariba. The probable conclusion from these traditions and myths would seem to be that Ifa developed slowly from very early times in the context of the cultures of the Yoruba, Nupe, Edo and Ibariba region. Thereafter, Yoruba creativity elevated Ifa divination and mysteries and enriched them with a profound body of folklore until the whole Ifa system became a sophisticated theme in Yoruba religion and culture, and Ifa became a very important Yoruba god, the god of divination and of hidden knowledge, the mouthpiece of the gods. In the long history of the development of Ifa and of Ifa mysteries, practices, divination and folklore, the Yoruba people gradually evolved a rarefied body of law, knowledge and wisdom known as Odu Ifa roughly, the body or fullness of Ifa wisdom. In its final form, Odu Ifa became the longest corpus of poetry in Yoruba folklore, a massive and ever-growing cultic body of wisdom encompassing historical and mythological accounts, exalted precepts, snippets of divine wisdom, life-related instructions, and the profoundest in Yoruba philosophy. It developed, most certainly, from very many generations of the loftiest in Yoruba folk wisdom, and it was meant to be, and was, the special preserve of the select elite. Known as the Babalawo, father of the secrets, the priests of Ifa. As the exalted profession of the Babalawo developed, the initial, schooling, of a Babalawo, consisting of intensive, unbroken, instruction in the practice of divination and in spiritual development, an unfaltering memorization of the entire Odu Ifa, was generally supposed to last for 14 years, but in reality his education was a lifelong pursuit. The nature of the Babalawo's life and profession demanded that he should be in regular contact, sharing and collaboration with other Babalawo. In every settlement and in every Ilu, an association or guild of Babalawo early came into being. Another very important development in Yoruba religion and cosmology was the belief in the afterlife. The Yoruba believed that the dead went on to live in another place of existence, some part of the heavenly realm, from where they could see, interact with, and help humans in this world. For that reason, Articles of clothing and of personal adornment, articles of food and of domestic value, were buried with the dead, in order to help them settle in their new other world homes. The newly dead was believed to be welcomed, home, by family members who had earlier died. The quality of life that one would have in the afterlife was believed to be determined by the good or evil life that one had lived in one's earthly life, and, for this reason, Yoruba society thought of its aged members as typically honest and trustworthy, in preparation for the afterlife. But there were also ways in which the living could assist the dead into a place of status and honor in the afterlife. One such way was a big, 
expensive, and prestigious funeral, the objective of which, 50, was to put on show, to both the living in this world and the people of the afterlife, the wealth and high status of the deceased, as well as his or her success in having many prosperous children. Another way, especially for the great and influential, was that the deceased's children would add a second burial ceremony far more expensive and more demonstrative than the first. For this second burial, the children of the deceased would commission a life-size naturalistic sculpture of their dead parent, which they would then dress in gorgeous clothes, put on show for a couple of days, and then bury. This is the second funeral. Ceremony known as Akko in Oo. 11 for the deceased who had been a great hunter in his earthly life. Another kind of help was also commonly given. This was made necessary by the belief that the spirits of the animals that the deceased had killed as a hunter could ambush and harass him on his journey to the afterlife and make his journey unpleasant. To prevent such, the hunter's children would mount a standing, life-size, effigy of the deceased father, dressed in his clothes, on the way to his farm, and the belief was that the animals would fix their attention on the effigy as if it was the hunter himself, while the hunter made an undisturbed journey to the afterlife. This practice was known as epid or ipade. The dead were also believed to reincarnate in their descendants, and to come occasionally to visit their communities. The belief in reincarnation led to the practice of giving personal names that identified some persons in every Yoruba family as reincarnations of departed parents, and the belief in the occasional visits of loved ones from the other world produced the Agungan cult. The annual calendar of religious rituals and festivals in every Yoruba community included one or two celebrations when Agungan, represented by Masked persons believed to be loved ones from the afterlife, walked the streets and visited homes. The Agungan came in various types of masks, in combinations of cloth, fronds, varieties of raffia, beautifully carved wooden pieces, decorations with beads, cowrie shells, etc., and for various purposes. Some were very serious very portentous manifestation specializing in performing rituals beneficial to society. Others went from home to home praying for and blessing people. Yet others entertained people with dancing or with sayings loaded with deep folk wisdom or with tales from Yoruba folklore. Some of the lighter ones just roused their community by fighting mock fights with people in the streets or by bearing whips and playfully chasing young people from compound to compound. In most communities, some prominent lineages came to have unique masks and a gungan of their own. The Agungan cult in every community had a highly revered priesthood, made up usually of men since women were not supposed to be exposed to a Gungan mysteries, but always including one or two highly placed priestesses. From a complex interplay of Yoruba religion and ritual practices and mysteries, of Yoruba knowledge of herbs, the power of herbs and of herbal preparations, of the mysteries of Ifa and divination, and of witchcraft and the occult, there ultimately evolved a more or less distinct profession whose practitioners came to be known as Adahunsha. The Adahunsha concerned himself very little, if at all, with herbal medications for health delivery purposes, or with treatment of the sick, or with divination as such. While he would usually know and employ any or all of these skills, his real focus was on the occult employment of herbs and other materials from nature, as well as the use of incantations, curses, charms, and amulets to enable his clients to accomplish stated social purposes, good purposes such as success and wealth, evil purposes such as hostile occult interference in the lives and affairs of other persons, or power purposes such as protection from certain weapons, or ability to dematerialize, or the ability to engage in out-of-body. 51. Actions. Usually feared by all the people of his community, the Ahansha, 
in the full maturity of his art, had. As his clients mostly rulers, kings, chiefs, warriors, the powerful, the influential and the ambitious, the practitioners of hazardous occupations such as hunting, and other persons seeking success or wealth, or seeking protection from physical or spiritual harm. There were, altogether, many types of associations, guilds and cults in the early Yoruba settlements. But, the most visible associations, to which everyone belonged, were the age-grade associations, called Egbe, Otu or Igbamo. Egegrade associations very probably evolved in the earliest days of Yoruba settlements, no doubt in response to the needs of the settlements, to provide an appropriate pool of labor for each of the various functions for which the ruler needed to mobilize people. Depending on age, one team could be called upon to keep the open places in the settlement clean, another to keep paths clear of ingrowing bush, another to effect repairs on public houses and shrines, and not to give backup services during large rituals and festivals, etc. Over time, the originally informal teams became formalized and institutionalized into age-grade associations. The youngest association in a settlement was constituted about every third year, and was made up of youths about 9 to 12 years of age. The inauguration of the youngest age grade association became a festival featuring consultations of the Ifa Oracle, the rulers giving of a name to the new association, and the association's election of its offices. Persons so elected held the offices for life, and there were two lines of offices, male and female. Over time, age grade associations developed meetings, rules and regulations, seasonal and annual festivals, etc. Outside one's own family and lineage, the members of one's age-grade association came to be one's closest associates and support in all phases and happenings in one's life. The public duty of an association depended on its age, from the youngest who kept public places clean, to able-bodied youths whose males could be called to military service, all the way up to the most senior citizens who were revered as the very essential pool of wisdom and guidance for their village. In the considerable security of life in the village and the Ilu, then, the Yoruba slowly molded the building blocks of their culture. In the ordering of economic functions, the organization of political life and governance, the molding of the relationship with the world and with the powers of the supernatural, the overall outlining of a worldview, the centuries of Yoruba life in the village and the Ilu laid most of the essential foundations. The primary building block of the village was the Agbo Isle, the linear compound. Eleven each constituting a home where many families lived together, all of them believing themselves to be one family, the Agbo Isle was a wonderfully fertile ground for cultural development, growth and refinement. Almost all the adult male residents lived by farming, supported by their wives and children. A typical day in the Agbo Isle, we may imagine, dawned with most residents, in their nuclear families, heading out to the farms, leaving behind the very old, the children, the nursing mothers, and those engaged in home-based occupations, like traders, weavers and dyers and, if there were any, herbalists, babalawo, blacksmiths, etc. For much of the day, these home-bound folks kept the Agbo Isle alive and busy with their various pursuits, while the children played various games in the dust in the open court under the eyes of the aged and the nursing mothers. The farming folks returned in the late afternoon, bringing headloads of farm produce and firewood. In the rest of the evening, each family cooked for supper, the main meal of the day. The hours after supper were the great time for socializing in the compound, the men in groups around kegs of palm. 52. Wine. And the women, still doing all sorts of light domestic chores, like spinning yarn on spindles, gathering the children, if there was no moonlight, to tell stories, usually folk tales accompanied with songs and refrains. These night folktale sessions were beautiful experiences in education and artistic expression, 
and a major contributor to the famed Yoruba wealth in folklore. If the moon was up, the children, joined by those older children who had spent much of the day on the farms, played in the courtyards. Moonlit nights could be very lively, beautiful and noisy in the compound, as the children played running games, engaged in wrestling contests, or put up some drama from their perception of adult life, a wedding, a chieftaincy installation, a festival, a dance, an intergroup disagreement, or a group meeting. In this whole context, Yoruba people invented many types of one-to-one -one and team games. Lineage meetings were frequent in the compound, some for lineage business, others for the elders to settle quarrels or to try infringements of lineage rules of conduct. The Agbo Isle was a very major contributor to the economy of its village. Farm produce and other products flowed from each Agbo Isle to the village market. Food, articles of pottery, mats, baskets, cloth, cotton wool and yarn, etc. Some Agbo Isle became famous as a source of certain products. Professions and trades tended to run in lineages. Days of celebrations were many in the Agbo Isle, village and lineage festivals and rituals, chieftaincy, rites, domestic rituals, funerals of departed aged members, weddings. A wedding was a celebration of a new pact and relationship between two, usually unrelated, lineages, the brides and the bridegrooms, and was always accompanied with colorful celebrations in both. In the full development of the Yoruba wedding over the centuries, the processes of the introduction of the contracting lineages to each other, the betrothal ceremony, and the ceremonial journey of the bride to her husband's lineage compound, all became greatly beautified by Yoruba creativity with dramatized banter, the giving of gifts, and the sharing of feasts. When all these were completed, the two lineages became linked together, ideally in perpetuity, by a bond of love and honor. The birth of a baby was a joyful event in the lineage compound, and for weeks, the oldest women members would serve the baby and its mother as nurses and house help. Days of mourning were also quite frequent, and every death pulled the whole Agbo Isle powerfully together in sorrow. Probably more children died in infancy than survived it. The death of a young adult kept an Agbo Isle in mourning for days. The Agbo Isle buried its dead in the soil of its own compound and regarded them as continuing to be part of the lineage and as continuing to participate in its affairs. Children, both those who were living and those yet to be born, were regarded as important members of the lineage. In fact, the universal Yoruba belief was that the adults of a lineage held all its things in trust for its living and yet unborn children. In lineage caucuses, respectful references were commonly made to the ones who went before and the ones who will come, and some of the latter were regarded as direct reincarnations of some of the former, a belief often expressed in the names given to new babies. The Agbo Isle took great care to involve its children in its affairs and rituals. Quarrels, often featuring noisy verbal exchanges, were on the whole, common, especially between women who happen to be married to the same husband. Over these and other kinds of interpersonal conflicts in the Agbo Isle, the lineage leader, Alori Ebi, spokesman for the departed ancestors, assisted by the lineage elders, exercised very powerful judicial and penal authority in all matters pertaining to the lineage. 53. The overriding principle was that every member, as descendant of the ancestors, had full rights to participate and express opinion, and ensuring healthy respect for the exercise of such rights was one of the most important duties of the lineage head, assisted by the elders. The Agbo Isle was the place of education. The proper nurturing of an Agbo Isle's children was the collective concern of all its adults. Every lineage raised its young in its own image, and equipped them with a strong knowledge of its history, especially its importance in the history of its village. 
this was the primary root of societal decency, and of the general historical consciousness, of Yoruba people. Children also learned the professions and trades common in their Agbo Isle, and this is why trades and professions tended to run in lineages. All in all, the early Agbo Isle as part of the village was the most important factor in the beginnings of the evolution of Yoruba civilization. Throughout all the ebb and flow of Yoruba history even until the 20th century, the Agbo Isle, with its family group or lineage, was to remain the primary identifier, educator and maker of the Yoruba person. There seem to have been considerable contacts between various regions and localities of Yoruba land in times often referred to as, before Adudwa. Hunters are generally credited in the traditions as the pioneers who first opened up tracks in the primordial forests of Yoruba land, and as guides of early groups to good sites for the earliest settlements. From an analysis of these traditions, Saburi Biobaku writes, a bold hunter usually led the way and when a suitable site was struck, he founded a town. 12 by the 9th or 10, following the precepts of the oracle, Ira Beji, a mother of twins, dancing in the market in Abeokuta. Photo, P. Verger, 1948-49, Ivan. 55, over. Some production facilities were not just replicable everywhere. For instance, iron smelting facilities were, in the end, few in the whole country, and blacksmiths must depend for their raw iron on very distant smelters. This lengthened the arms of trade not only beyond the village, but also far beyond the Elu. As earlier pointed out, the construction of Agbo Isle and shrines improved continually in complexity and decorations. Not every settlement could have the artisans and artists for these services. Most settlements must employ people from other settlements or even from distant Ilu. Over time, a guild or association developed for each of these trades, and its members served clients far and wide. Some village markets, as earlier pointed out, became known as the best places to sell or buy particular products, so that people from every village increasingly went there for those products. Over time, it became the way of life in the Ilu that some village markets were open on certain days and others on other days. In this way, the four day market cycle peculiar to Yoruba commercial life evolved each village market being open only every fourth day. Professional associations and guilds grew to establish links with their counterparts in other villages. It was, no doubt, in the context of these wider linkages that the association of herbalists, on a second, evolved. Their stringent, virtually sacred, rules of mutual help of herbalist to herbalist. This ensured that if one herbalist encountered a difficult case in his village, he could count on help from herbalists from other villages. The Babalawo, priests of the god of divination, Ifa, developed identical links and rules, and so, too, did the guild of hunters. By and by, each of these guilds created festivals at the Ilu level. Intensive and very powerful linkages arose from the exogamous nature of marriages. And, most importantly, even though each settlement had its own protector spirit, all the settlements in an Ilu acknowledged and made rituals to a common protector spirit for the whole Ilu, and held its high priest in great awe, and, from time to time, deferred to his ritual prescriptions or requests. The great surprise is that in the face of all these unifying realities, the rulers and people of the villages in the Ilu setting persisted in regarding each of their villages as separate from its neighbors and as self-contained. The explanation, earlier stated, is that the religious or spiritual guarantees which sustained separateness as the norm were so powerful that no groups internal to an Ilu could challenge them. That, 
as far as everybody knew, was the way people lived, and nobody knew any person or group of persons who lived any other way. All of the linkages among the villages in the Elu were looked upon, not as negating the separateness of each settlement, but as necessary support for it. The individual settlement was home, beyond that was the outside world. The rules of inheritance and succession fitted perfectly into, and reinforced, such a worldview. But the forces of change continued slowly to increase in impact. Ultimately, by about the 10th century AD, the Yoruba world was ready for major steps forward. As it happened, the first of those steps were taken at Ife in the heart of Yoruba land. The great importance of Ife in Yoruba history, therefore, is that it was the first Yoruba village group or Ilu to step out beyond the encrusted framework of many centuries into the bright lights of a higher political culture. The chapter that follows will tell that story of Ife. 11. Opa Orin Mian, Isle Ife. Photo. P. Verger, 1953, Ivan. 56. This marks the end of the this chapter. Join US in the next stream for the next chapter.